Sí. Muy, muy buenos días eh, a todos, gracias por estar aquí en esta, en esta sesión para conocer un poco más sobre las herramientas de finanzas verdes, el radar de riesgo. Eh, nos da mucho gusto tenerlos aquí, tanto a los que están ahora, las personas que están ahora aquí en sala, como a todos aquellos que nos acompañan en línea. Eh, en los días anteriores del festival, eh, les comparto, estuvieron conectados más de 3.000 personas, entonces pues eh, eh, hay muchas personas eh, justo atentas a lo que está pasando en este festival, en este intercambio de ideas, en este intercambio de soluciones para el, el financiamiento sostenible. Y le voy a, eh, le voy a pasar la palabra aquí a Ana Lockman para que nos presente al profesor eh, Pale, por favor. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días a todas y a todos. Um, antes que nada, muchas gracias por la invitación a la GZ, a NAFI y Hacienda para par participar en este evento muy importante. Y bueno, el día de hoy um, nos gustaría aprovechar, tenemos el día de hoy tres sesiones por parte de la Spakas Stiftung Alemana y ahora vamos a empezar con una sesión para presentarles una de, un, de nuestras herramientas que se llama el Rara de Riesgos. Y esta herramienta se desarrolló por parte de nuestro experto, profesor Dr. Tobias Pailo. Tobias es experto en temas de sostenibilidad y ha trabajado ya muchos años um, para las cajas de ahorro en Alemania, pero también para la Sparkassen Stiftung Alemana. Ahí Tobias nos ha acompañado en diferentes proyectos, en, en diferentes países en el mundo, en Georgia, pero también Tobias ha trabajado conmigo aquí, aquí en México y también en nuestro pro proyecto en Costa Rica. Y bueno, Tobias es también, um, aparte de ser como consultor para la Spakas Schriftung Alemana, Tobias es um, profesor en una un universidad en Alemania, en la uni Universidad de Kempten, y es profesor de, en temas de economía y finanzas y también en temas ahí de sostenibilidad. Y bueno, Tobias, nos da mucho gusto que estás aquí con nosotros el día de hoy. Lamentablemente, solamente de forma virtual, pero bueno, estamos muy felices de tenerte aquí con nosotros. Y bueno, ya no quiero hablar más y robarte tu tiempo, porque vamos a tener una presentación súper interesante. Entonces, te doy la palabra a ti, Tobias. Thank you very much, Diana. Ladies and gentlemen, it is really a pleasure to be here with you. And even if this is just uh, an online presentation, and I'm not able to be there with you on location. It is a great honor to be here and I really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time and thanks. What I want to present you today, as Anna has already introduced, is one of the tools that we at German Sparkassen Stiftung work with in the topic of green finance. And, and we have established this special tool worldwide in over four continents. And I want to share the experience that we have there with you. And So what I have prepared today is first this short agenda where we put the tool into context of climate change and especially and the challenges that are presented by climate change especially. And then we will go to the topic where uh, this uh, this challenges result in a dramatic change for both the economy and the financial sphere. In this context, it's very important to know about ESG risks and for these ESG risks, we'd like to present uh, assessment and management tool, the risk radar. then actually yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, I am already in the English channel, but how do I switch this? 
just give me a moment. Uh, I have to, to, to look at this uh, this channel. Uh, it's quite irritating <laughs> to, to hear both. Um, so I'm in the English channel and uh, ah, the original. OK, now this one. Now, can, can you say something? Can I still hear you? I, I cannot hear you at now. Si, sí, sí, bueno. Did you hear me? Is it? You keep, you yeah, keep I can hear you. Talking, it's, it's okay. You keep talking and is, we were translating here in Mexico. Is this the right channel? I, I, think, okay. I think so. Is so it I the can regional? stay within yes. the channel. Okay. Thank you very much. This is really helpful. Okay. If I'm too fast for the translation, then please stop me. Um, and otherwise, uh, I will continue. So thank you very much and sorry for the delay uh, with a te few technical problems to solve. Yeah, as you are in this beautiful festival and all have heard about uh, many aspects of green finance, I think we can keep the introduction rather short. However, it is still important to put the tool into context. And this context actually is the clear and present danger that climate action that we all um, have to take will fail in the end. And this is really a present risk. And this is not just said by me, but also by the Global Risk Report, which is published on an annual basis by the World Economic Forum. You know the World Economic Forum from the Davos Forum in Switzerland. And uh, they publish every year an overview over the most pressing and most important risks that, uh, that humanity are facing. And uh, they differentiate that in a two years horizon and a 10 years horizon. And what you can see here is a color code uh, with different problems stemming from the economic, the environmental, the geopolitical, social and te technological sphere. And while on a short term we have different uh, considerations that humanity is facing, especially the cost of living crisis and last but not least the geoeconomic confrontation, um, for the longer perspective, actually most of the problems are green ones, meaning they have an environmental background. And on the very top of that list is the failure to mitigate climate change and also the failure to adapt to climate change. And these are the key consideration. And even if this is on a 10 year horizon, what we can already see is that global warming is actually already taking place and it has increased in recent years. And the consequences of that are manifold. These are just several examples of heat maps around the world where we can see very high temperatures all around. If we go to the global context, then the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has published on a uh, regular basis their findings. And uh, what you can see here is that over the last 2000 years, actually, the development of our climate was going in the direction of a new ice age. And this development has dramatically changed uh, 150 years ago at the beginning of the industrialization, where we have experienced a very pronounced global warming, which if we differentiate the causes for that, can be very much, uh, it can be very much said that this is caused by humanity, especially caused by burning of fossil fuels and uh, the resulting climate gases, the greenhouse gases that are um, in the atmosphere as a consequence. And this landscape actually is uh, something that is always very worrying, not just to me, but also to all the students. I'm showing this map on a regular basis. Actually, it is a color coded version of a heat map of our world at the end of the century. And the dramatic message that it bears is that these purple zones will be more or less inhabit ininhabitable. So these are more or less dead zones on our planet because the mean annual temperature will be above 29 degree. And this is, of course, no temperature where human be beings can live. And it's also no temperature where 
agriculture or something like that can happen where we can grow food and so on. So this is a very dramatic picture. And uh, what's even more dramatic is that this is by no means a worst case scenario. But actually, this has been generated by the University of Exeter for the most probable scenario that we are walking into, which is a global warming of 2.7 degrees until the end of this century. You can also see here from the IPCC um, the estimations for the scenarios that we are facing. And the 2.7 degree is actually the mean of the development which will be established if current policies um, actually are uh, acted upon in the same way that they are promised right now. So this already includes the climate action that uh, politicians around the world have pledged to do. This is, of course, far from the Paris Agreement, and it is far from the situation that we want to go. So obviously, in order not to make this situation a reality, we have to be actually more active in climate um, mitigation, in climate change mitigation, and also, uh, as a matter of fact, in climate change adaptation. And this brings us to the very important aspect, how the financial sphere can support these efforts. And this brings us to the question, what actually is green economy and what role can green finance play in this context? As we have already talked about agriculture, I think this is a very good example. And in agriculture, we see that agriculture is always at the receiving end of climate change. No matter what happens in climate change, uh, be it actually flooding or wildfires or hailstorms, as you can see as just a little selection of acute climate events in these pictures, they are always hurting agriculture and agriculture will lose harvests in so many ways. Then we could actually say that agriculture is really worst on the on the receiving end of climate change, but it is not just at the receiving end. It's also causing climate change very much. So agriculture is also jointly responsible. If we look at the emissions of climate change, for example, the laughing gas emissions from soils or the methane emissions from husbandry, or the emissions from storage and um, from from all kinds of, of um, um, energy crops and, and, and storage of energy crops and so on, and the liming and application of urea, we can see that actually 20% of global GHG emissions as an average are caused by agriculture. So actually, this is a vicious circle because climate change has a very high impact on agriculture. And at the same time, agriculture is very much contributing towards climate change, fostering this impact for the future. So if we want to change the system, we have to act in two different ways. First of all, we have to stop this contribution in the form of climate change mitigation. And second, we also need to think about climate change adaptation because some of the effects of climate change are inevitable and we have to help agriculture with the adaptation. And if both measures are considered, then we can talk about green agriculture consisting of mitigation on the one hand and adaptation on the other hand. This picture can easily be transferred to many other economic sectors. So, for example, for the energy sector as well, there is a strong impact on from uh, climate change on the energy sector, like, for example, what you have seen uh, in so many countries, but especially in, in France, for example, in the last year, about half of the nuclear power plants of the countries had to be switched off because they need water to cool the reactors. And as this water was either not there anymore because there was a drought happening uh, or it was much too warm, then actually it could not be used for cooling purposes anymore. The same is true for many countries that rely on hydropower and uh, with 
the river uh, rivers uh, in decreasing in, in the volume of water actually this also hits the energy supply of those countries and this of course has an effect on so many other sectors as well and the energy sector in itself and so many other sectors as well of course are very highly contributors and uh, towards climate change as well so the same picture that we have seen for agriculture can be um, adapted to the whole economy and we see that actually green economy requires two pillars of actions. The first is the climate change mitigation and the second is the climate change adaptation. And in the words of Antonio Guterres, uh, the, the president of the United Nations, what we can also see here is that finance has to take this prerequisite and half of climate finance must go into adaptation in his words and the other half into the mitigation. So we are already talking about financing and the financing aspect is so much important that it's also in the uh, summary of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change um, that is on, on several aspects, on uh, several points, we see that the basic recommendation is to provide finance for climate action. I have just copied out here from the report and the summary for the decision makers several of the key points where you can see that there's a highlight for the access to finance and um, the, what I want to quote here directly is if climate goals are to be achieved both adaptation and mitigation financing would need to increase manifold. So there is really the prerequisite for any climate action happening is that this is embedded into the financial system. So green finance is one of the mo main levers that humanity has in order to ma make climate action happen and not to lose this battle against climate change. And this brings us to a very important overview, which also will be used to show where our tools are working and what we are doing in this sector, uh, in this aspect. So let us sum up that the economic sectors, agriculture, but the, also the energy sector and so many other sectors as well, are put under high pressure. And this pressure for change results on the one hand directly from climate change but on the other hand, also from political initiatives, which also are driven by climate change, and then also by market changes. And these market changes could be driven by climate change or by political initiatives. Just as an example, in agriculture, we can see that agriculture is at the receiving end of climate change, so there's a direct impact. On the other hand, this direct impact is recognized by politicians, which is why there are several laws in so many countries to change the way of agriculture, to mitigate climate change, and also to um, sensitize for climate change adaptation. But this, of course, has consequences on the markets, as has the availability of food due to harvest, uh, harvest failures and so on. So there are, this is really a complex system of interactions and changes and together they put the sectors under pressure for change. And change or transformation as we also say requires financing. So this is actually where the banks come in because the banks can actually cater for these financing needs with the provision of loans and with the provision of investment money and so this as we have already seen from the demands of both the united nation and the ipcc this is actually what is required the banks should provide these funds in order to make transformation happen and to enable the companies and the sectors to deal with this chain this, this challenge um, that is presented to them it would be a beautiful picture if it would stay at that. But now there is also a darker perspective to this picture. And this results from the fact that if there is a transformation going on, and this is a very strong transformation, then this transformation will always know winners and losers. And the losers of the transformation are the companies who are either not willing to change or are not able to change or they are hit directly by climate change. And if the banks have financed these companies, then this will result in financial losses. 
this is why the banking supervision now also comes into the picture and says, dear banks, uh, financing needs are very important to cover here. And we also want you to support this transformation. But please take into account that you have to do some risk management as well, because you have to consider which of the economic sectors are so much under pressure that the companies are probably not able to change and also which of the companies are not willing to change or not sensitized enough and be careful when you give them their loans. So actually, this is a very important aspect, which is also part of green finance, which makes actually sense to differentiate here because we are talking about green finance and, and this obviously seems to be uh, the same term. So uh, anyone could say it's the same topic, but it's really not. There are two different forms of green finance. The one is very much based on action and transformation and climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation and provision of financing for these measures. And the other form of green finance is risk based and it is very much focused on protection of the banks in order to protect financial stability as well. So these two aspects are completely different from each other. And then we also have even a third form of green finance which is the sustainability consideration and the question of responsibility, the question of fairness, the question of CSR, which are of course all these questions present for some quite some time, um, but they always have been on a voluntary basis for the banks. So we have already seen some other responsible banks and some banks who are not so responsible, but this was voluntary. And now actually this question of sustainability is enhanced with the two other perspectives. One of them presenting a very, very important business case for the banks. So green finance actually is, as you can see here, not one topic, but it's several topics in one. And this makes it so hard to assess because all the banks who now need to deal with green finance and now are new to the topic really are overwhelmed because they are obviously so many different aspects and some of these aspects are not really compatible. Some of these aspects are completely different. And this is so confusing for the management that actually it makes sense to first bring order into that chaos. And for that, we have developed one tool that we are not going to show you today, but in a different workshop, which is the Green Finance Compass. And the Green Finance Compass is a structuring tool. It gives an assessment of the implementation of green finance in a financial institution, be it a bank or be it a microfinance institution. And with these, actually, we can see where the change is necessary and also what kinds of objectives are already implemented and how far advanced the implementation of the topic already is. We can then use this as a controlling tool and translate it directly into project management. It's a very, very successful tool. We have implemented it in Germany uh, for over 400 banks, be it uh, savings banks or be it cooperative banks. And we have also implemented it now on four different continents with many different partners, um, be it banks or microfinance institutions. And we have really great success in this tool as well. So I would very much recommend to you to uh, visit the other workshop as well. My workshop is now about our second tool and this second tool does not cover all the aspects of green finance as the compass does, but it is very much limited and in, this, in the focus on the aspect of ESG risk management. So this is really the consideration, how can banks deal with this topic and what can they do in a rather pragmatic way to identify the risks that are resulting from this context and how they can manage these as well. And as these are ESG risks we are talking about, it is necessary to give just a little more background on the topic of ESG to understand quite what types of risks we are measuring. And this also gives an approach of how we do that, how we assess this measure, measuring. First, ESG actually 
covers many different aspects. It is often uh, confused with sustainability because going back to that picture, E stands for environment, S for social, G for governance. And that could be uh, mistaken for the very same perspective of sustainability because there we also have an environmental, a social and also an economic sphere. However, what's the big difference, uh, I can also, will also show you in the next slide, is that the perspective may be the, 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 um, uh, yeah, the same perspective actually, but the questions that we then ask are quite different. While sustainability is very much about responsibility, ESG is very much about the economic effects that result from these developments. So in the words of the banking supervision, and I have quoted the European banking supervision here, ESG factors are now environmental, social or governance factors that can have a positive or negative impact on the financial performance or solvency of a company, state or individual. So this is rather general and it's really high level of words perspective definition. What we can see is that they refer to developments, events or framework conditions that have a touch point with ESG, meaning these could be environmental aspects, social aspects or governance aspects. And they hit the company. And if they hit the company, it is what we call the outside in perspective. So this is coming from outside. And what actually the results and consequences for the company are, is very much dependent on how the positioning of this company is. Just let me give you an international example. At, this, um, at the moment, we have in many countries a discussion of a ban on the combustion engine because the combustion engine obviously is one of the main factors in transportation that is, uh, has a very strong impact on climate change because quite a lot of GHG emissions uh, can be attributed to that. So obviously, if the combustion engine is banned, then this will be counting as an ESG factor. Whether this does damage to a company or not is very much dependent on the type of the company. So if the company is in relationship with automotive sector, so it doesn't have to be just a producer of cars, it could also be a small garage repairing cars, then actually it's a question whether they can deal and um, also uh, deal with electronic cars as well, or whether they are simply reliant on the combustion engine. If they are very much focused on the combustion engine, then this ESG factor might really destroy the pool business model of this company. However, if they are flexible enough and willingly enough change their business model towards electronic mobility, then this might also present quite some opportunity. So the factors, the ESG factors can have positive or negative consequences. And what kind of consequences they have, this is dependent on the strategy and positioning of the company. And of course, the company also has effects on environmental aspects or social aspects. And the larger the company is, the bigger and, and more pronounced these effects are. And this is what we call the inside out perspective. So both perspectives are very much to be kept in mind. Remember, they are the same as we've seen with the green economy and green agriculture. The one is how is this affected and the other one is how does it affect itself. For example, climate change or the, com um, the, the community in the company, uh, in, the, in the country and so on. So now the consequence of that could be three. First of all, we could have opportunities. Of course, uh, the example of electronic mobility is a very clear and present one. Also with renewable energies, we can see that these are presenting new business cases and new opportunities. However, most of the companies are more or less facing risks because their traditional and conventional business case is called into question. And if these risks are actually happening, then we will also see that these result in write-offs. So they will also result in costs. And we also have additional costs for the companies, which are systematic costs. Like for example, if investors and banks are now more interested in these topics, 
they will also require um, some publication of sustainability reports and so on, which of course have to be written and produced. So this is also uh, resulting in cost for the companies. And now to the point where we have to differentiate between ESG and sustainability. And this is very important because many people mix them up and they get really confused at that point because sustainability is something that everyone associates with very positive aspects. Whereas ESG, if you simply take it um, as a synonym for sustainability, might cause some frowning upon. Like for example, if we hear that Coca-Cola uh, gain a prize for their ESG management and at the same time Coca-Cola is not associated with sustainability at least not by everyone so how does this fit together and um, I want to show you that actually this does not fit together because ESG and sustainability are two very different aspects so for starting from the same uh, viewpoint, we can see that actually from the outside in and inside out perspective, we can pose different questions about a company. The one would be from the outside in perspective, what kind of do these ESG factors have on the company? What kind of impact has the framework conditions? What, how do the demands of the stakeholders change? What about changing regulations? What about changing markets? And then if we talk about the inside out perspective, we could talk about the action of the company or the inaction of the company or how it deals with its stakeholders. And uh, what does it do about its way of production and its products? So actually we could also put it down to the point, is the company a part of the problem or is the company a part of the solution. And now, if we look at it from a sustainability perspective, we would be very much interested in these aspects that are part of the inside out perspective. And we would ask whether the company is behaving responsibly, whether they are behaving uh, in, uh, in fairness and uh, in line with ethics and whether they uh, respect justice and whether they also have maybe a, even an intrinsic uh, motivation for this. So we are very much looking at the inside out perspective and we are asking questions about responsibility. If we look at this from an ESG perspective, then our focus first widens because we are not just looking at the inside out perspective, but also very much about the outside in perspective. And the questions that we are asking is, what are the chances and opportunities resulting through impact, through action, through inaction? So we are talking about the economic consequences, not about responsibility and not about sustainability. This is why a company who could have a perfect ESG management does not necessarily have to be a sustainable company. And on the other hand, a company that is a very sustainable company may have problems with their ESG management because they are not really dealing with the outside in perspective, for example. So it's very, very important to differentiate that. And this also brings us uh, to the perspective of ESG risk management for the banks, because this is not sustainability risk management. It's ESG risk management. We are asking about the consequences of these developments on the companies and whether these consequences have effects on the banks. And here it is very important to consider that opportunities and risks for the companies, which are the customers of the banks, do not translate in a one-to-one -one perspective. So we could not say whatever causes an opportunity for a customer is at the same time an opportunity for the bank. The same is true for the risks. We could not say everything that puts the company under risk is also a risk for the bank. But there is a slightly shifted view on opportunities and risks. And this comes from the fact that actually opportunities do only translate into opportunities for banks if investment is required. Because only if these opportunities require funding, the bank can earn from them. And the bank can even earn from risks because ESG risks for the companies require adaptation and these adaptation measures need to be financed. So ESG risks for the companies could result in ESG opportunities for banks. However, ESG risks for the banks are very much driven by those risks that have an effect 
on the solvency of the companies. So wherever the risks are strong enough to cause write-offs or likely to do so in the future, these are the ESG risks for the banks that need to be managed as well. And of course, the banks also have their own costs from write-off and systematic costs as well. So what you can see here is that from the banking perspective, ESG opportunities and ESG risks are also very much present, but they are not the same as with the companies. This brings us to a very important aspect um, of transformation finance. Transformation finance is the business case of the future for the banks in the topic here, because actually transformation finance is just brilliant. The banks earn from the fact that they help their customers to mitigate their risks. At the same time, this is also a risk mitigation for them as well. So they earn from it and they mitigate their risk. It's a win-win situation. And it's also a win situation for the companies because they are better adapted and uh, can also be part of the solution then, which also makes for a win-win situation for climate, for the society, for everyone. Transformation finance is the big miracle in the green finance topic because it is really suiting everyone and every purpose. And this is what we need to maximize in the future. However, we also need to consider risks. And the risk is now the aspect that we are focusing on. Not because it's more important. Transformation finance actually is probably the most important topic here. But risk management is important as well. And if you do not have your ESG risk management in line, then the damage that will occur will be strong enough to also threaten all the success that you could have from transformation finance. So risk management is very much on the top agenda for the banks and it has to be dealt with. And this is also why central banks worldwide spring into action, write sensitization reports like guidelines, like action plans, whatever. And they tell the banks, please consider ESG risks. Again, I have quoted here from the EBA, the European Banking Authority, but nevertheless, actually what you can find in here is very similar to what you can find internationally in all the publications of the central banks. And what was important here to quote is that actually the view of the, um, the, the central bank is very much in line of what I've just shown in this picture with this slightly tilted view of ESG opportunities and ESG risks for the, for the banks because they are only considering ESG risks that are hitting the customer. So if, for example, a bank is directly affected by climate change, then the banking supervision and the central banks are not counting that as an ESG risk, but as an operational risk. They are only counting the risk that is hitting the customer. Like in this very basic example, the bank gives a loan to a client and of course it expects repayment. Then some climatic effect happens. The client is affected and is affected in a way that she or he cannot pay back the loan anymore. And this is a classic form of ESG risk for the bank. And these effects that could hit the customer are differ differentiated into chronic and acute effects, which is why also the risks resulting from them are also differentiated into chronic climate risk and acute climate risks. They are also called physical climate risk in this case, because this is really what, what is physically happening. Chronic effects are all the effects that result, for example, from heat waves, from droughts, from sea level rise. So these are the long-term effects resulting from climate change. Whereas these long-term effects, of course, can cause conditions in which extreme events happen. And these acute events are often much shorter in their duration, but they could be very, very devastating. And they are often influenced, like for example, if we have a heat wave over a long time and a drought over a long time, then wildfires are much more likely, which we can see, for example, what is happening in Canada right at the moment and uh, in so many other countries as well. 
Um, and then also if there's, for example, a sea level rise, then of course, um, this uh, like this an, or heavy rain for a long time, this will result in in um, water locked uh, gr uh, ground, which then could also cause landslides and so on. So these chronic effects very much um, influence the acute ones. And just to give an example on very few sectors, these physical risk in their chronic and acute form can have very devastating effects like in agriculture on the crop, the groundwater, in energy, hydropower and cooling circuits. As we have said, in construction, it could cause damage to the building sites. Uh, it affects the availability of timber. It causes heat stress in the building process. In transportation, it will damage infrastructure like roads uh, are destroyed if there's a heat wave over a long time and also railroads and so on. But these physical risks are not standalone because they have consequences. And most of the time, these consequences result directly into monetary consequences. So we have what we call the transition risks. And these transition risks are also affecting other sectors as well. So for example, and also other spheres as well. So if agriculture is hit by physical climate risk, then there is very likely to be a price rise in, in, um, in, 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 in uh, vegetables or in, in grain, in crop, whatever. And this also increases the problem of hunger and poverty. And if energy is affected, then of course there is a price increase in energy, which affects so many other sectors as well. So we can see that physical climate risk also uh, causes a lot of pressure and also causes a lot of regulatory pressure, which does also uh, affect transition risk as well. And this makes for this conglomerate of pressure that is now hitting the companies and dearly requiring change and dearly requiring actually transformation. And the estimations for the global damage resulting from these effects uh, are really not encouraging. So this is, for example, quoted from the European banking um, um, supervision, and they say that with the global heating of three degrees, which is now approximately the path that we are on to, as we have seen, we will have probably an impact on the global economy um, on the cross-national product of the national of the global economy of minus 23 percent so this is really near a breakdown of global economy that is happening here which makes it so important to deal with these risks so as a summary because before we now get into the aspect of managing these risks esg risks are very much about climate risks and these climate risks can be physical climate risk in the acute or chronic form or transitional climate risk. However, of course, ESG factors are manifold. So they are not just focusing on climate change, but also other environmental and social aspects as well, which is why we also have to consider other ESG risks as well. And last but not least, also moral and ethical risks, which could also, which could also have effects. So this is a strong conglomerate of different forms of risks that have now to be considered. And the main problem of these risks is that they are not fitting neatly into our scheme of financial risk management. Our scheme of financial risk management, as it is shown here, is actually considering different forms of risk in a separated way. Like for example, as bank specific risks go, you look, if you are an investor, at market risk and see especially the price risk as a stock exchange. And this is the major risk that you're facing. Um, if you are a credit institution and you offer loans, then the credit risk in the form of credit default risk or value change risk, solvency risks, these are the risks that you're considering. And now with ESG risks, we do not have as such a neatly additional column where we could say now we have in addition some ESG risks to consider. But ESG risks are complicated in that they are really a cross risk, that they are underlying all of these different risks and this makes it too, so hard to assess them. And this assessment has to be uh, in the form of identification, evaluation and action and here uh, we see worldwide different approaches and the approach that I'm showing you right now is 
the exposure method, which actually tries to go into the general in the in the assessment of ESG risk management in a rating or scoring approach as a difference to the so-called science-based targets, for example, that could also be used as a measure here. I just want to give you this overview. We don't, for time reasons, we cannot go uh, into detail everywhere. Just to say there are different forms of ESG risk assessment. And the form that I'm going to show you now is in line with the exposure method here. And this is called the risk radar. And the risk radar is the tool that we have developed and that we try to uh, aid our with, with which we try to aid our partners actually in the measurement and in the management of ESG risks. And this tool was very much developed for the savings banks in Germany uh, three years ago already. And it has been implemented over a hundred times for the savings banks in Germany and now has spread uh, due to the great work of uh, German Savings Bank Foundation for international cooperation and with many international partners we have already implemented this risk radar as well. And the risk radar is a pragmatic approach of assessing ESG risks. And the ESG risk management process, which you can see here, starts with the ESG risk assessment and then it goes into the risk calculation and into the risk management. And as for the ESG risk assessment, this is arguably the most complicated part because as soon as we have this assessment, we can calculate and then manage the risks. So this is the strongest aspect and the, the biggest challenge. And this is where the risk radar puts its focus on. And here for ESG risk at the moment, we have the problematic situation that worldwide banks need to assess ESG risks from their customers, but the customers are often not yet informed about ESG risks. So if the bank asks questions like they would do in any other scoring or rating methodology, then more likely than not, the customer will not be able to answer these questions. So while normally a scoring starts bottom down and we talk about, uh, we talk directly with our customers and we get the information that we need for the risk assessment directly from the customer. In this case, we have to start higher up and go bottom down, um, sort of top down instead of bottom up. And this means that we have to start at the sector level because the ESG risk informations are clear and present on the sector level and not on the individual customers level. So we do this ESG risk assessment on the sector level and then we apply individual modifiers and from that we then have the ESG risk score for the individual customer. This can I aid us into the ESG risk calculation, whereas of course we have to take into account the volume of the loan that is at risk. We also have to take into account the collaterals. In the topic of ESG risk management, we also need to consider that collaterals are often also affected by ESG risks. Like for example, if we have a farmer, then most of the time what the farmer can offer as a collateral is the land of the farmer. However, if this very land is hit by climate change and partly destroyed, then also the collateral may be gone. So it also requires reassessment of the collaterals as well. And this could then aid the bank into setting thresholds and limits, be it on sector level or on individual level, and then also, of course, into questions of pricing and so on. As we will talk about risk management a little later, um, I will still uh, leave it at this message for the time being that you have to be very, very careful with uh, setting risk thresholds on sector level. Because, of course, um, the risks are taking place in the very same sectors in which transformation is needed. So if the bank considers, ah, there is risk, we don't give loans anymore, then of course there can be no transformation. 
and also the customers uh, are really put into even deeper pressure than they have been before because now they even do not get any funding and do not get any financing for, for uh, really dealing with these risks. So what we have to be very careful is to say there is risk, yes, and we need to consider it, but we need to consider it in a very differentiated way. And this is what we will be also talking in a few minutes about. So let's just start with this assessment and how do we achieve that? So we start at this sector score and we go into an assessment of physical climate risk, transition climate risk and other ESG risks. And we do that in a very structured, but nevertheless very pragmatic way. There are quite a few tools all around which try to quantify these risks already. But with the quantification of risks, the problem is that we need, of course, reliable data. And the question is, where do we get this data? For ESG risk, the answer is often we do not get this data because ESG is future oriented, whereas the data that we have is from the past. So if we even if we would have the data that we require, they would already be outdated the moment we use them. So it's very hard to use mathematical models at the, at the time being, which is why we try for a more qualitative oriented scoring approach. On the example of physical climate risk, we differentiate, of course, into acute and chronic. And now how do we approach that? First of all, we define a five point score and say, OK, uh, a score of zero would mean that the risk that we are talking about is just theoretical. It cannot be proven. Uh, it will likely to be happening in the future, but not yet. A score of one would mean that it's already perceptible. And there is also proof in individual cases. But um, even if there are some losses, it's not a major problem at the time being. Level two, however, would mean that the risk situation is very obvious and there is accepted proof of the harmful effect. Level three now makes both the uh, obvious, makes, makes both the appearance and also the amount of damage significant, whereas level four makes this existential. So what we try to do then is for every of these aspects, we apply the scoring and see what is the level of risk that we are already facing. And we started earlier on with a merely qualitative approach where we did as much research as possible. And then we tried to attribute these different, also with the help of local uh, experts, we tried to apply these different scores to that. Now, in the moment, at the moment, we are in the process um, of further developing this tool. And what I'm showing you here is a little work in progress. Um, you can also see that it's work in progress. It's not uh, finished uh, from for visual perfection yet. But what you can see is that we have a more differentiated scoring approach that we are using. So, for example, for the estimation assessment of acute climate risk, the basic question is whether acute climate events in the country are likely to already have a negative impact on the sector considered. If so, we give a score of one already, which is then further considered with different aspects, like, for example, um, is it causing, is there an observed loss of um, assets or property? If there is an expected impact on revenue, if there's expected impact on costs, um, are these aspects likely to increase in the future? Is the sector a node point in the value chain? And also how flexible is the business model? And all of these things are attributed to the question uh, based on research. So we are trying to read as much information uh, about this uh, for the sector as possible. And then we also talk to local experts and then we score each of these aspects. And also, even if there is for the time being no negative impact on the sector, it could likely be in the future as well. So this also needs to be considered. And what I'm showing you now is uh, the first um, assessment for, for example, the sector of agriculture in Mexico. And we have worked through that and uh, we found that, of course, there already is some negative impact 
um, happening by acute climate risk on agriculture in Mexico. There are also proven events uh, where there was damage to property. Um, also, there is proven, uh, there's proof for an impact on revenue and costs. And also, this is likely to increase in the future, which then actually gives us the score of three for the acute climate risk for the agricultural sector in Mexico. And based on a similar scoring, we work our way through these ESG risks. So the next one, for example, is transition climate risk. And transition climate risk is a little more complicated than physical climate risk because we can find so many sources on physical climate risk, but what their consequence for the change, for the transformation will be, this is rather more complex, which is why in our model, we go into first a differentiated view and say, first we have to consider what is the GHG emission contribution of that sector? Because the higher the GHG emission contribution, the higher the pressure for change and transformation in the sector is, which is why this counts in as 50%. And the other 50% is made up of transitional intensity. And for the measurement of transitional intensity, we use indicators. And these indicators are used on accepted models of stakeholder management, namely the model of socioeconomic rationality. It sounds really complex, but it's a really beautiful model. I really like this model because it explains how a company is embedded in a complex context which consists of a legal sphere and politics and a technological, a technological sphere, a market sphere and a cultural, social cultural sphere. And all of these are also influencing consumer behavior for the company. And now we can use this model to differentiate indicators like, for example, transformation pressure can be driven by law. And if it's driven by law, the question first could be how high is the probability of a regulatory change in that sector? And the second question could be if there is regulatory change in the sector, does this really have a pronounced impact on the sector? So we have two different indicators in this sphere. For the technology, it's always the question whether there is an alternative technology available. So all the talk that we are doing about the abolishment of the combustion engine wouldn't happen, I would say, if we do not have, would not have the alternative of electronic mobility. If electronic mobility wouldn't be there, then we wouldn't have an alternative and we wouldn't abolish the combustion engine. So there always needs to be an alternative in order to make this alternative a possibility. And this is what we are looking at in this indicator. And last but not least, it's also a question whether the consumers are actually accepting the alternatives. And these do not always have to be technological alternatives. In agriculture, for example, it could also be a method like organic farming. Organic farming is a technology that is available um, as an option uh, com uh, that, that can be used instead of conventional farming. And now the question is, do consumers accept organic farming? So also back to our, to our uh, flowchart uh, scoring of this, I want to show you this on the first indicator that I've just talked about, the probability of regulatory change. And for the probability of regulatory change, we also use the version that the assessment for the agricultural sector in Mexico and what we have found here in our research. And first of all, the question is, is there evidence that the considered sector will be subject to regulatory change in the near future? And for the agricultural sector in Mexico, this is very much the case. So we can say, yes, there is evidence which brings us at a score of one already. And then we look at the country um, because even if it wouldn't happen in the own country, so probably uh, if it's not, for example, if it's not happening in Mexico, it could already be happening in neighboring countries. And if it's happening in neighboring countries, then the probability that it spreads to other countries would also be given. This is why we're always looking first at the country itself and then at the neighboring countries as well. 
And it's always a question whether it's just considered or whether it's already established. And there's also the alternative that it's already established and it's now even extended. So you can see that there are different levels that we take into account here. And it is both uh, announced in the considered country and established in other countries. And also it stands under the context of catastrophes and economic losses, which gives even more pressure to the regulatory probability, resulting in an overall score of four for this regulatory change. So you can see that we are working our way through all of these ESG risks in a very determined and, determined and very systematic manner in order not to forget any aspect of ESG risk management. It is not quantitative, so we do not need any databases for that, but we do need knowledge. And this knowledge can be gained from studying resources, and these resources are rather different. So for example, if we look at law costs, then of course it's a question what kinds of laws are available in the country and also what kind of laws are announced in the country. However, if we look at technology, then our sources are of course quite different. So we always look at the relevant context and try to find as much information as possible in order to put this into these subscorings. And then we have a score for the physical climate risk, for the transition climate risk, with all these indicators and then we also see that this is resulting uh, that, that there are other aspects to to be considered as well which are not looked at in the same level of differentiation but more in a generic manner like for example are there losses of biodiversity uh, are there possible human rights issues and so on so these are considered as well but not with the same focus as the climate risks what I show you here actually is part of a publication of a central bank because we worked on this very topic together with the National Bank of Georgia. And the National Bank of Georgia has published this ESG um, scoring um, method with a risk radar for its banks and also recommended the use of that for its banks. Uh, so there is a document also available in the internet on the risk radar published by um, the Georgian National Bank. Uh, and if you are interested in that, uh, we will of course give you first the slides of this presentation and we could also add the publication of Georgia as well to have a little more insight um, on the methodology. And this, for example, is now an example for agriculture in Georgia, where we have also assessed in a very same way that I've shown you above, and we came to a risk score of seven. For our work in progress, for the adaptation of the risk radar to your country, um, we also have uh, done some research, preliminary research here. This is not the finalized version. We also need to talk about uh, this topic with local experts some more and so on, but we came even to a slightly higher risk assessment of the agriculture in your country, resulting in a risk score already of eight. Uh, and the differences are especially uh, in the acute and chronic climate risk and uh, also some other minor factors as well. So what I just went over with this, uh, this slide is what I want to show you now. All of that is based on assessment and assessment needs to be explained, which is why we are not just delivering these numbers, but we are also giving explanation about that. So what have we found in the research and why is this actually um, yeah, arguing for the level that we have chosen here in the assessment. Both together, the scoring and these argumentations uh, also give you the opportunity to change this assessment. If you're saying, well, I think uh, about this topic in a different way and I think the acute risk should be higher or the chronic risk should be lower or something like that, you could also change that on your own. What is now the consequence, actually, if you do that sector by sector by sector, then you have a list of risks, of ESG risks for the different economic sectors, 
We could even uh, go a little deeper into the different sectors. This is just the main overview, also stemming from this document from the Georgian National Bank. Of course, we did this also for subsectors in agriculture, for example, for crop farming and for husbandry and so on. They're quite different then, of course, um, in their effectiveness as uh, they are on the parental sectors here. And what you can see is that there are several sectors that are already very high risk with a, with a very high ESG risk and other sectors that do not have so high ESG risks. So this first helps you to get an overview over the situation in your portfolio. And this slide was already present a little before and I went over it because I want to cover it right now. Um, this is actually an excerpt from the a publication from the Bank for International Settlement from last year. It's called the principles for the effective management and supervision of climate related financial risks. And this is of course well worth a read. And since it is published by the Basel Committee and uh, the Bank for International Settlement, it has high relevance for the whole financial sector worldwide. And um, I just copied out two major demands here. The first is that you really have to understand as a financial institution, the impact of climate related risks. So you really have to understand these risks. And then also you need uh, to have methodologies to identify, measure, evaluate and monitor these risks. And now this is also very important. You have to develop heat maps to assess the concentration of ESG risk in your portfolio. And these heat maps can be generated using the risk radar. And this is also an example from Georgia where you can see that we have used the overall loan portfolio of the country and we have assigned our sector assessments to that and have now differentiated where there are sectors in the loan portfolio with very high risk, where there are sectors that are vulnerable and where there are sectors that are more or less irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It may seem, it may come as a surprise that there are so many ESG risks in the loan portfolio. What I have to say to this a special figure is that we have left out um, all the retail loans. So if you count in the retail loans in the portfolio and the retail loans are not so much affected by ESG risk normally. So then actually you would have a much larger portfolio and the section under risk would shrink very much. So normally if we do this sort of heat map for loan portfolios, um, it is above a quarter, about a quarter of the portfolio that is under risk and not as it is here, two thirds. But if we leave out the, the consumers and the retail loans, then of course this changes a lot. And now that we have this information, the next question is, what do we do with that? First of all, we could say it's set limits, yeah, but we cannot set a limit at agriculture and say we are not financing agriculture anymore. But then actually the next step would be to apply these individual scoring modifiers and come actually um, from the risk score that we have measured uh, by the application of these modifiers uh, to a new client related risk score. And this is the methodology that we can immediately apply given all the uh, knowledge that we have in this assessment um, of the different um, sub scorings. We know what are the relevant aspects and we can modify them accordingly in order to then get really the, the few questions, the very few questions that we have to ask our, com uh, our customer. Um, to make this mitigation of the risk score and ask, for example, just two or three questions. These two or three questions are even better um, if we already have in a country a taxonomy, because with a green taxonomy, we can base these questions on the taxonomy and then we can very easily see the level of adaptation that is given here. So this is really a very good way to assess this difference. But even if we don't have a taxonomy, we can still work with that. So this was the basic overview over the risk radar and this assessment methodology. And while, of course, I could talk 
on length on that topic uh, because I am personally very fascinated by that and I'm also so happy that uh, the feedback from the partners that we've worked with is, is really a very good feedback. Excuse me, to, uh, excuse me, Professor, we didn't hear you. Now, and um, thank you very much first uh, for your attention until now. And then, of course, please uh, come up with your questions. What uh, is left open? Where can I answer questions? Please, uh, I'm perfectly available for your questions now. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. We are uh, sending you some questions right now in Spanish. Then uh, turn off your uh, <laughs> your translation option. Well, bueno, entonces les, les pediría, bueno, si tienen preguntas por ahí, por favor, eh, les pediría que si pudieran hacerlas en español para que no tengamos que estar haciendo el switch y no en lo que estamos aquí a, al profesor. Entonces, este, adelante. No sé quién tenga por aquí alguna pregunta para por ahí. Por ahí este, hay, 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 hay. Claro. Entonces, eh, y de este lado, preparan, preparando sus preguntas, por favor, en español. Entonces tenemos más o menos unos 10 eh, minutos para, para este tema, un poquito menos de 10 minutos, entonces por favor, breve, sí, adelante. Si quieres acercarte un poquito, el, el, este creo que está apagado, y acercarte. El... Gracias. La primera es si lo, en los modelos CSG eh, se considera el riesgo reputacional. Eh, eh, con herramientas como pueden ser eh, RepRisk o el monitoreo de noticias. Y la segunda es si los sistemas SARAS eh, en las instituciones bancarias pueden ser considerados como eh, ESG. Can you please repeat the second question? I'm sorry. Uh, the first one I got perfectly, but there was an interruption in the internet connection and I didn't hear the second question correctly. Please, if you would be so kind. Sí, gracias. Eh, la segunda es si los sistemas SARAS en las instituciones bancarias eh, pueden eh, ser considerados como, como quien monitorea los riesgos ESG. Eh, y es SMS um, Systems. El SARAS. Which, which systems? Sorry, the, the Cyrus system, I didn't understand the, the term. What, what system? Sorry. Es el sistema uh, de monitoreo de riesgos ambientales y sociales. An ESMS system? Uh -huh. Yes. Whether they cover, cover what? I, I don't. I, I still didn't get the second question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sí, el SARAS no lo conocen allá como SARAS. Si le puedes explicar un poquito más yes. qué es el SARAS. Yes, um, SARAS could be an SMS system, an environmental and social monitoring system. Uh, could this uh, SARAS in institutional banking uh, monitor ESG risks? Okay, so sorry for, for the... Okay. Now, first, for your, for your first question, the first question was on the question of reputation, and reputation is, oh, I have to turn this translation, I'm very sorry, I will be back in this channel in a moment, but since I have to switch channel, this is otherwise uh, really uh, problematic. So, um, now, back to this slide, actually. Um, yeah, the reputation um, is, is covered, um, however, it's only part of the aspect that we are considering. As you have seen, the focus is very much on climate risk. So we are considering other ESG risks as well, but the reputational risk is especially context of the stakeholder model. So what we assess is that actually if the demands of the stakeholders that are from either the political sphere or from the market sphere or from the society sphere, if they are not met, then this causes a reputation risk. So you could say that this is an implicit form of reputation risk consideration. As it is, 
uh, needs to be considered anyway in a bank. So go back to the system. Reputation risk was and measurement and assessment of reputation risk was always a part of traditional and conventional risk management. It was even considered to form a stronger part in previous um, established uh, basal, uh, basal, basal regulations. It was then uh, just uh, put, uh, decreased a little of importance, but it, it was always present. And reputational risk is always also linked with ESG issues. Like for example, if you have greenwashing issues, then this is a direct form of reputational risk management. In the consideration and definition of the banking supervision, these issues like greenwashing, for example, and these reputational risks wouldn't count in as ESG risks. The reason for that is that in the definition of the banking supervision, ESG risk has always to be transported via a customer. Let's go back to this definition um, of the banking supervision. Um, the ESG risks are, have to, to meet three prerequisites. The first is that any negative financial impact of the bank, uh, of course, there has to be a negative financial impact. The second is that this has to be in relationship to ESG factors. And the third now are the counterparties. And if you consider, for example, greenwashing as a reputational risk issue, then yes, it may have a negative consequence. Yes, it is related to ESG factors, but no, it's not really related to counterparties or invested assets. So in the terminology and the definition of the central banks, it wouldn't, all reputational risks wouldn't be part of ESG risks. ESG risks have to be transported via a customer. However, in our logic, and this is in this slide, actually, we do consider them as other ESG risks and as moral and ethical risks. This is why we model them in, but we are not really focusing on that because our main focus is um, the, the climate risk and our main focus is to stay in line with the definition of the central bank, very much this ESG risk that happens over the customer. So it's very much the risk-based definition. And this also brings us to your second question. All parts of conventional and uh, traditional risk management that we have in the banks that are suited to give us this information, how do ESG risks affect the customers? This is very well suited to guide you in this assessment process. As for example, we can find here uh, environmental or social risk management systems that many banks have already established that really give us this outside in perspective and also uh, tries to, to assess the consequences for that. And if these are already embedded in the conventional risk management that you use, this is a perfect prerequisite here. However, all parts of conventional risk management that is focused on these traditional columns of risk management. I'm sorry, um, I've, I wanted to show you this slide uh, with, the, with the columns of risk management. And, um, and in that, this slide, it's obviously a little slower going you now this, this one. All parts of the conventional risk management that are focused on these conventional forms of risk management. Here it's very hard to uh, find any connection to ES risk management in the status quo and they have to be redefined actually. So um, it's really first the, the question of the scope. Do you want to integrate all and any um, ESG related aspects into this risk management? Then you are not in line with the central banks anymore. Or do you want to simply focus on the demands of the central banks and then it is very much about the impact on the customer and only if it has an impact on the customer and this brings damage to you, then it is considered to be ESG risk. I hope this, this helped. Gracias. Voy a hacer la pregunta en español y después en inglés para que sea más rápido. Gracias. Eh, 
como hemos visto, los riesgos ESG se están concentrando en información de riesgos de clima, porque es donde hay más información y más modelos. Sin embargo, es súper interesante ver esos otros riesgos que nos contaron hoy que se pueden hacer. Y quería preguntarle al profesor cómo visualiza a cuándo o qué necesitamos para tener riesgos de biodiversidad. El colapso de la biodiversidad y especialmente en países como este, México, el mío, Colombia, Brasil, es inminente en la planeación de las empresas y de los bancos y del sector financiero, pero no hay modelos todavía que nos permitan mostrarlo, o sí, esa es un poco la pregunta, ¿cómo visualiza y qué, tan, qué tanto tiempo vamos a pasar hasta que podamos incluir esos riesgos de biodiversidad? Profesor, do you like the question in English? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, of course, it is uh, very. There are so many, so many problems, so many global problems that need to be considered, and um, biodiversity is chief among them because uh, humanity can also very much. Uh, be faced with a situation where one species really uh, results uh, where the extinction of one species results in a tipping point and this tipping point could also in the same manner that tipping points uh, in, in, in climate risk could have a devastating effect. This very same could be true in biodiversity. As for biodiversity, the problem actually is that this loss of biodiversity has happened now for a long time and it was not connected in any way to the financial sector. The financial sector and uh, the risk of the financial sectors have really stood apart from that and uh, not even the central banks have said, well, just be careful what's happening there because, uh, and this is really the problem and the differentiation that I said, the distinguishment between sustainability and ESG that we are facing here. If we are talking about sustainability, then all of these aspects, like the loss of biodiversity, have to be counted in and have to be considered as serious risks. But as it is, we are talking about ESG and now ESG only comes into question if the factor like loss of biodiversity has economic consequences. And the question is, where are these consequences? I see quite a lot of companies that are hurting the environment and are hurting biodiversity, but they have no economic from that. And if they have no economic losses resulting from that, then this is also not an ESG risk, neither for them, let alone for the banks. We have to change that, of course. We have to change the fact that actually the prices under which companies can produce are needed by the damage that they are doing. This is a legal issue and it's a society issue and it's a sustainability issue. But as long as biodiversity is not resulting in economic losses, it is not constituting an ESG risk. And that is a very, very sad story. This is why I always say, be careful. So ESG is not sustainability. We are not doing a sustainability assessment. We are doing an ESG risk assessment as it is demanded by the central banks. It is important and it also has consequences on mitigation of climate change and adaptation to climate change. But it leaves many other important questions out of the consideration. Having said that, also, if we look back at our scoring methodology, which I'm going to reshare right now, hopefully you can see this as well. Um, and this, this methodology also includes the aspect of loss of biodiversity. Uh, actually, the screen that I see for myself now, okay, there was really a large delay. I, I shared this uh, slide a little earlier. So you, what you can see here is that there are also, among other ESG risks, we consider the loss of biodiversity. We do not consider it in the same way and in the same focus as we do with the physical risk or the transitional climate risk, um, because this is not really at the time being, sadly, for the economy and the consequences of the economy. It's not so relevant as climate change. Hopefully this will change in the future and hopefully we can give this more importance in the future. But at the time being, it's more rather a footnote where we're saying, okay, if a sector is hurting biodiversity, then this could develop 
into a problem in the future, which is why we consider it in the scoring. But we are not considering in the same weight as climate risk. And again, really, I have to be very clear on that. This is not a situation that I defend. It's not a situation that I like, but we are not measuring sustainability. We are measuring ESG and ESG is always in our current economic system, whether these social and environmental aspects already have an economic impact, then they can result in a risk that needs to be measured. If they are not relevant for the companies because they can simply ignore them and go on as before, then they are not constituting an ESG risk. And this is really what we also try to model here. We try to consider all and everything, but on the other hand, um, it's very important that we still keep our focus on the effects of the financial system. And if there are no effects on the financial system, then we do not include it or do only include it in, in a small way. If we see that this changes, if biodiversity gets the importance that it deserves, then we will also model that in the tool. So it's a tool for the financial industry to meet the, the requirements of the central banks and of the banking supervision. It's not really the tool that we need from a society perspective to make this a better world. And uh, it's as it happens, the green finance is a very, very good development toward a better world. But it has some way to go, I have to say. The whole concept has a way to go because it is still very much uh, in line with economic thinking and not mm -hmm. with sustainability related thinking. Muy bien. Lamentablemente ya se nos acabó el tiempo, pero me gustaría agradecerle mucho a Tobias por esta presentación que ha sido sumamente interesante. Muchas gracias Tobias por haber tenerte aquí. Y bueno, como les comentaba Tobias, nosotros por el momento estamos justo trabajando ahí en el en la finalización de la herramienta para México y ahí vamos a presentar nuestros resultados en los próximos meses. Um, y bueno, muchas gracias por su interés en este tema y quisiera aprovechar también ahora un minuto para hacer promoción para nuestras otras sesiones que tenemos el día de hoy, organizada por la SPAC Stiftung Alemana. Como les comentaba Tobias, um, tenemos también otra her herramienta que se llama la brújula de finanzas verdes. Esta herramienta la vamos a presentar también el día de hoy a las cuatro y media. Entonces espero que vea ahí otra vez algunas caras conocidas. Pero también tenemos otra sesión súper interesante a las dos y media, este dos y media a cinco y media. Es, suena ahora muy largo, no se asusten. Eh, Pedro, es, um, ahí vamos a presentar nuestro simulador de gestión de resiliencia climática. Es un juego empresarial, o sea, un, un business game que vamos a presentar y también vamos a jugar la primera ronda con ustedes. Entonces, ahí también es súper interesante y también muy divertido. Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank you very much and have an enjoyable workshop.